Welcome to Type Tune Tint. I'm Tom Kranz. A virtuoso performance of a Beatles classic becomes a dose of musical medicine in the hands of today's guest. Andrew Shulman, brought back from the brink of death by music, is on a mission to bring musical medicine to every intensive care unit in the world. His participation in a just-completed study confirming music's healing properties is the latest achievement in a career that's taken him from the concert stage to the bedsides of critically ill patients. And there's more to come. And I'm joined once again by Andrew Shulman, uh, who we met on this podcast two years ago in 2022, February, when it was cold. It's 90 freaking degrees in New Jersey here now. It's the dead of July in 2024. But Andrew and I go back even farther. We worked together at a resort in the state of Maine in like 1973, I think it was, 73, 74. Yeah, 73. So not that I want to do the math, Andrew, but that does make this like a 50-year-plus yeah. Uh, friendship here. And that's yeah. like, I don't have that with anybody else except Don Berman, who you know, yes, who Don. I know for an additional year, uh, yeah. who I also met at that resort. So, you know, it was it was really kind of great that I we reconnected back in 2022. And we did that on the occasion of me discovering the book you wrote uh, called Waking the Spirit, which is uh, an, an autobiographical account of the near-death experience you had that obviously had a happy ending, but it, you know, in a bigger way, it launched your kind of your new life, uh, teaching uh, about medical musicians and music and medicine that then blossomed into this study that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. But first of all, let's talk about the very important anniversary that you're marking in July of 2024. Sure. Well, uh, uh, it's funny uh, that Every now and then I like to say that as a musician, the best career move I ever made was to take a five minute gurney ride from an operating room and uh, to a surgical intensive care unit and drop dead on on the. (laughs) um, Yeah, sounds funny now. It was not so funny back then, though. um, Actually, I had a great time the whole time. And people think that I'm joking. But I'm not. I, I had coma dreams or uh, I had these hallucinations that I actually remember. And I remember all of them over a, that lasted over a seven day period. Wow. And um, the uh, I actually the first coma dream uh, or it wasn't in, I wasn't even in the coma yet. So the, this first hallucination was I was in the Pacific Northwest where I used to live. I'm a New Yorker. But I lived there for three years and I'm running as fast as I can in this beautiful meadow in the Pacific Northwest. And I look off to my left and there's the house where the old couple lived who, who gave me a room. Wow. And then I realized, I, oh, they're so sad because I'm going to have to be leaving. <laughs> and then I fade to black, which I think is then when I was clinically dead for two minutes. Then I come back. And I'm I'm still in Washington State, but I'm in the eastern part of the state on a ranch with a bunch of ranch guys, and I'm one of them. And we're hosing down an old Ford pickup truck. We're pouring water into it, and that's what they were doing to me. They were they were infusing five liters of fluids into me to get my blood pressure up again when I was in the hospital bed. Jeez, so, that's a pretty detailed dream. All right, before you go any further, let's review really quick for our audience who probably doesn't remember. So it was 15 years ago this month, July, that you essentially, you went into the hospital for, I guess what you thought was was cancer. It turned out not to be cancer. That was the good news. Yeah. But the bad news is you suddenly went into this, your, your body just started shutting down for reasons essentially unknown, correct? Reasons unknown. After the surgery... By the time they got put me on the gurney and got to the door of the operating room, my blood pressure started plummeting and it actually went to zero and my heart stopped. And it was a race to uh, you're clinically dead then. Clinically dead is a term used where there's a possibility they can bring you back. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where they got me into the surgical ICU. There was a fantastic medical team in there. And they were able to resuscitate me. And that all happened 
uh, on uh, uh, in July 2009. So it's 15 years ago. And I count my alive day, which is a term from Vietnam that now people use who are not just military. It's a it's a survival of a day when it other if there hadn't been extraordinary efforts, you would have died. Hmm. So my alive day, I count as actually July 19th. Okay. Which so is we the just, music it, saved me. Did we just pass that a week ago or so? So, yes. so you ended up, uh, so you were, you, you died for a couple of minutes. They brought you back. Right. Uh, and then they, they put, they, they put you into a medically induced coma. Right. While they figured out what the hell was going on with you. And you were in that coma for quite a while. And right. And at some point they kind of, they were not sure what the hell's going on with this guy and whether you would even live. Right. Well, nobody thought I was going to live. There wasn't a single doctor or nurse in the unit. I found this out later when I did the research for my book. Mm. Uh, nobody thought I would live. And in fact, uh, the chief doctor in the unit uh, on the evening of the first full, full day uh, had a meeting because they had a where they discussed the plan for each patient. Mm -hmm. And they said, as far as Andrew Shulman, if he lives, which he won't, but if he lives, he'll be in the ICU for a month, step down for two weeks and um, a regular room for two weeks. And um, what actually the, the medical team saved me on the first night after the surgery, they kept me alive for the next two days. And it's in the third day, a Sunday at around noon, where I always love telling this to doctors and nurses, my lactic acid number was 17. When I say that, eyes pop out because normal is 1.8. Oh. And very few people are still alive after it reaches 10. Sure, and my sure. number was 17, mm -hmm. which meant that whether it was five more minutes to live or an hour, but I was absolutely on the way out. And that's the, the alive day moment, because it's my wife, Wendy, who is understanding everything that's going on and terrified and reaches into her bag for her phone and uh, sees my iPod and the light bulb goes off. Mm. She turns to the attending physician and she says, he loves music more than anything. His heart is beating, but his soul isn't. Mm. And I believe only music can give him the will to live. And I want to use his iPod. Can we do that? The attending physician that day, a guy named Dr. Simon Iriff, I'll always love Simon Iriff because most doctors would have said no, you know, because you put the iPod in and the patient drops dead immediately and then the doctor gets sued for malpractice. But he said, I'll give you 30 minutes. Hmm. And they put the iPod in, they didn't know what to play. And somebody said, just click the first track. And that was one of the whole series of things that saved my life because the first track was my ultimate favorite piece of music ever, the St. Matthew Passion of Johann Sebastian Bach, which has the most dramatic, amazing opening movement ever. And I, that, first movement is what saved me i feel sure of it so how but, long did it take before the music kicked in for lack of a better word and you started to come around that's a good question so uh he had only given 30 minutes by the end of the 30 minutes the music had already begun reversing the metabolic process that mm. was killing me and uh the way they knew that is you are connected to a vital signs monitor that's monitoring your heart rate, your blood pressure, your oxygenation level, and your respiration. Sure. Now, right un until the music starts, I and I had not been stable for a moment in three days, meaning that if you looked at that I, uh, vital signs monitor, you'd see the heart rate going up, down, up, down. Same thing with the blood pressure. It would really swing back and forth. Oxygenation was low. Respiration, I was on a, a ventilator, so that didn't matter and everything. So by the time they get to 30 minutes, people were looking up, the doctors and nurses were stunned because they saw all of a sudden, this guy's beginning to stabilize. Hasn't hmm. been stable in three days. 
and uh, it continued right through, even after the music was finished, there is what one of the doctors called the blossoming effect of music. So it was in my head and it, it had gotten my brain stimulated again. Music lights up more of your brain than any other stimulus. Hmm. And it starts producing chemicals. And so the layman's way of understanding it is that this music activated the brain, stimulated the production of good chemicals like dopamine and serotonin, which started flowing through my body. And as she said, the chemical flow carried a message. And the message was, it's not time to shut down yet. Hmm. That saved my life. Wow. So let me, at the, at the time, so you've learned all this since then, of course. Right. But at the time, yep. do you think there was either skepticism or do you think there was kind of the thought that it was just a coincidence, right? They put the, they put the music on and then suddenly, you know, for, again, for reasons unknown, you stabilize, or did it really take time for it to sink in that the music really did this, that the music really had an effect? The, the doctors and nurse who, nurses who were there all expressed to me that they were very aware in that moment that the intervention of the music was the lifesaver. Okay. Because the medical treatments that they were doing for three days Didn't were, was, wasn't saving my life. Yeah. I would have died. All right. So you used, and, and so you eventually obviously woke up and you learned all this stuff and thank God for your wife that she thought of this and said, Oh, maybe this will work. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so since then you've now kind of used that as an inspiration, I guess you not only did you write the book about it, which by the way, folks, if you want to read a book that sucks you in and just kind of makes you continue to scratch your head that, wow, I can't believe this actually happened to this guy. Read Waking the Spirit. It's a really incredible, it's a it's an incredible story. But you then went on a kind of a mission and then jo were joined by others, including doctors and researchers, to kind of codify and solidify actual evidence that music has a physiological effect on sick people, correct? Correct. Yeah, and so, and, so and, and how did that start? That that start at Beth Israel Hospital in New York where you got sick? The day I was fully out of the coma. Um, it was the eight o'clock that morning mm -hmm. where I was now out of the coma and out of this. I had, a, I had about 24 hours of a post coma delirium, but I was out of that. So I was fully present. Okay. And my wife at eight in the morning walked into the bed area that I had in the ICU. And when I saw her come in, I looked up at her and I said, oh, hi, Wendy. <laughs> and the smile on her face was a once in a lifetime smile. Wow, I bet. Because also I had, uh, without going into the details, certain things that happened, which they were sure would have caused brain damage. And that's another, I won't get into that right now. Okay. So the thing is, I knew who it was, I could speak, so on and so forth. And at that point, I assumed that I, my surgery had been the day before. I didn't know I was in a coma. I knew I had a lot of these dreams. I was aware that I'd had a lot of dreams. When you came out of it, did you, did it feel like you had just been sleeping for the whole time? Sleeping and dreaming, you didn't, I yes. just said you didn't know you were in a coma, but. I um, came, I fully came out of it at around 3 a.m. Okay. That morning. Um, and um, I'd had a series of coma dreams and the final coma dream, one of my favorites, is that I had been looking at a mystical white disc that was spinning, revealing life on earth starting from one-celled organisms all the way up through then i saw the dinosaurs i saw the early mammals because i'm a history guy i love reading okay. and that's what i'm watching in this magical disc and i get up to the romans <laughs> and all of a sudden the disc stops spinning and i'm staring at it and it dawns on me i realize that's not a magical disc it's a light fixture over my bed yeah. <laughs> and that's it's right. that moment that I become aware and a crucial thing happened in that moment. 
I looked around me and I saw all these medical machines with colored lights. And it's 3 a.m., so the lights are fairly dim, not out, but fairly dim. And I look at this ventilator machine on my right, which was not on. I was off the ventilator, but the machine was still there. I see the IV monitor and I see the vital signs monitor with all these colored lights. And my very first thought looking around was, this is fascinating. Now, that's a crucial, crucial thing that happened. The reason I say that is because I was open to the experience. The majority of the time that people are in an ICU or come out of the situation like this, they're very frightened and often traumatized. Sure. But I'm a weirdo. So to me, I just thought, wow, this is so cool, you know, <laughs> looking at all this stuff. And that left me open to what happened that next morning when Wendy comes in and sits next to me. The very first thing she says is, your surgery wasn't yesterday. It was eight days ago. Oh, jeez. You went into shock and they saved your life and you don't have cancer. Wow. Now, when she finished that, and I've asked her huh. if this, if I'm remembering this correctly, I was completely, she didn't say anything else, and I was silent for a full minute. Hmm. And for many years after this, Wendy's love telling people, it's the only time she can ever remember me being silent for as long <laughs> as a minute, if I wasn't playing the guitar. <laughs> okay. And I didn't know yet that music had saved my life, by the way. Hmm. But I, I was aware that I'd been given the greatest gift you can get, your, a second chance at life. Yeah, no kidding. And I, and I knew that I had to give back. I had to, I couldn't, I didn't want to go into survivor's guilt. And the only way you can avoid that is to give back. And I didn't have money to give the hospital, but I had my guitar. So I turned to her and I said, this place is gloomy. It really needs music. I'm going to, when I get better, I'm going to come back here with my guitar. And that started the whole thing. And, and that's what the, you did. And by the way, you mentioned mission uh, before. That's when my mission, the moment my mission began, and I was on fire from that moment on in the hospital. So they had estimated 30 days in the ICU. Mm -hmm. I was only in the ICU 10 days. Mm. And then two doctors came in on the 10th day, started laughing, looking at my chart and said, we're going to skip stuff down. We're going to put you in a regular room. Mm -hmm. And on the second day in the regular room, they both came back, looked at my chart, and started laughing, and they said, we're going to send you home. In medical terms, no one will ever know how I survived the first night and the coma uh, situation of the third day. And in medical terms, no one will ever know how, why my recovery was that fast. But I think it Really, the recovery, I think, we came out of two things. Fortunately, I was going to the gym five days a week. And mm -hmm. I always tell people, if you're going in for surgery, and especially if you have enough time, start exercising. The better physical shape you are in, the better your chances. Mm, sure. but, the, but the second thing was, I had a mission. Mm. I was going to go back there, and I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. So I think that's what did it. So you embarked on this mission to bring music to ICUs because you know, I, it, it, it did something for you and you recognized, as did the doctors around you, that this was like a real thing. Um, and that uh, began the whole medical musician category of what practitioner, I guess, right, is what you are now, essentially, right? Well, here's the thing. The, the big field is called music and medicine. Okay. The central core profession in the field of music and medicine is music therapy. In order to become a music therapist, it, it's actually you go to college for that. You become a music therapy major. You do four years. A lot of people then go on, get a master's, and, and some get a PhD. Mm -hmm. But that's the core profession. Got it. Okay. When people ask me and say, I'd like to do what you do, and I say, if you really want to do this full time, that's the the best thing to do sure uh, look up the american music therapy association online and find out what to do so that's step number one but and i was in my first few months at this hospital 
one of the most famous music therapy departments in the world was located, the Louis Armstrong Center for Music and Medicine. This was at, at Beth Israel? At Beth Israel. Okay. So how, I mean, I was lucky in so many different ways. Hmm. And the director of the music therapy department, a woman named Dr. Joanne Lowy, a few months in actually encouraged me to become a music therapist. I'll never, it was the most wonderful email I got. She'd been watching me unseen hmm. and said, you're a natural at this. I still have the email. And you should really think about music therapy. And I got very, very excited about that, asked her what I had to do. And she sent me links to several universities that had programs. And I started looking at it, but I really, I was 57 years old at the time, still a very active New York professional musician. And long story short, I didn't want to do homework again. <laughs> and I didn't want to go back to school. Sure. And so then I had to say, well, if, I, if I'm not a music therapist, which I wasn't, what am I? And I just thought of the term medical musician, which has evolved for me. Um, a medical musician is uh, somebody, the, uh, when, when I co-founded the Medical Musician Initiative, we describe what a medical musician in critical care is this way it is a professional concert level musician who's had pertinent training in critical care medicine and who becomes a member of the medical team in a critical care unit that's our definition of a medical right. musician now okay. i have never had any formal training but i had the best possible training because i went back to the icu where i'd been a patient and I uh, was given the freedom by Dr. Lowy to develop my own way of doing music in an ICU. And I had the doctors and nurses who had helped save my life, who were thrilled to have me back for a number of reasons. And I, I learned very quickly that all you have to do is wait till a doctor or a nurse is sitting at a computer and looking very bored. <laughs> then you go over to them and ask whatever question you want. And I would get these 20 minute answers about blood pressure and strokes and uh, all kinds of medical conditions. That's the pertinent training in critical care medicine. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I did that. Uh, I started in January 2010. And um, by, uh, uh, you know, develop friendships and collegial relationships. And in 2018, we founded the Medical Musician Initiative. And, um, and right now, it's a very exciting time for us. We've just added a few wonderful people. Uh, can I mention just a few names? Yeah, of course. Our, our medical advisor is Dr. Joseph Schlesinger of Vanderbilt University Medical Center who is, uh, all, he is an uh, anesthesiologist and critical care doctor and a fantastic jazz pianist. Huh. Um, our associate director, I'm the executive director, our associate director uh, is Javin Bose. He is a graduate of, in music of Vanderbilt, but is also following the family tradition. He's gonna be going to medical school next year. He's a 25 year old guy who is a uh, research coordinator at Mount Sinai Hospital here in New York. And the, th the third person we added is Greg Silverman of the University of Minnesota, who's our technical advisor. So we have, a, 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 our mission is twofold. Workshops to teach mu musicians, professional musicians, how to do this, mm -hmm. and research. And we're, we're working on a, a new, uh, uh, well, you and I will talk about the Georgetown study in a minute, but we're working on a new study, actually, that I can't say much about because it's in the development stage right now. But we're, it's a very exciting time for us. So the, in, um, the initial goal is to essentially teach musicians to do what you did or what you right. do. Yeah. Uh, so that we're populating, you know, hospitals with musicians who can essentially bring the healing power of music to people who are in bad shape, life threatening conditions. So do you have, are there more now? Are there any musicians at the point now where they're doing that? Or is that 
an immediate like, uh, short term goal? No, uh, when uh, before the pandemic, we had done several summers in a row of workshops mm. and we trained several people who are now working in hospitals doing this. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then the pandemic came along and that yeah. stopped everything. Now yeah. we're getting started up again. We just uh, we're building a, a new roster of musicians. Um, uh, there are um, uh, two new musicians who are now working with us, Randall Despommier who is uh, in New York and a fantastic alto saxophone player. And Kati Mayorga is a guitarist. And she, she's a wonderful uh, guitarist with uh, her roots in Latin America, and she brings that into her music. If you had, in every ICU in the world, part of the medical team in an ICU being uh, a therapeutic musician, mm -hmm. I guarantee you, that the results would improve in that ICU. That's how powerful, when it's done right, you know, you can do it wrong and mm -hmm. it can be dangerous. But when it's done right, it's a very powerful because you have three constituencies in an ICU, the patients, the family and friends, and, a, and the staff. And they're all important. And on any given day, you might be playing more for one of the constituencies than the others. More with Andrew Shulman in just a moment. And we're back with Andrew Shulman uh, from his home in New York City. I'm Tom Kranz joining you from beautiful 95 degree Fanwood, New Jersey. Um, we heard, uh, you know, one of the reasons we're here today again with Andrew after the first time we talked to him a couple of years ago is that uh, it's the 15th anniversary of his, what he calls his alive day, the day that he he died and then came back to life because of music. And since then, he is, uh, he participated and actually played a key role in a study about the effects of music on ICU patients uh, done at uh, Georgetown University. Uh, the very first tune that I played uh, coming into the podcast, uh, Here Comes the Sun, the Beatles tune, was a song that uh, was one of the tunes that Andrew played as part of this research. So um, before we get to the, kind of the details of this study, which actually which actually proves that, you know, what everybody already thought, that music actually plays a role and can play a role in making people better because of all the vital signs that it improves. But tell us how you got involved in this and tell me exactly what your role in this study was. Okay. Um, in one of the workshops that MMI did in the Berkshires, um, uh, a woman named Julia Langley, who is the faculty director of the Arts and Humanities program at Georgetown University Medical Center. Uh, she came up with three of her musicians to take our five-day workshop. And that's how I met her and the players. And I stayed in touch with them. And in January 2020, I hadn't spoken to her in a while. I called her up and we had a great phone call and said, we'd love to do some work together. And they were thinking of doing, putting together a study. And I said, count me in. Now, uh, within a month, the pandemic started. And so one of the things we knew was that it wasn't going to be live music. It had to be recorded music. Mm. So um, they gave me the responsibility to come up with what we'll call the dose and the duration. The dose is the repertoire and duration is how, what's the timing of it. So for and, the first time, your music is being referred to as a dosage, essentially. Yes, it is a dosage because it's, well, it, and I love that because it's, we call it musical medicine. And I, 
uh, I spent some time thinking about this and what I came up with for the study was that there'd be three sets, morning, noon, and evening. Each set would be about 20 minutes long because to me, the, a, a, I always think of 20 minutes of music at a bedside as a treatment. Gotcha. Now, hmm. so, sometimes you play shorter, sometimes you play longer, but 20 minutes is good. I like that number. And so a set is basically a series of, of pieces that you play that are played one after another. Yes. Yes. And you craft those sets so that there is kind of like a flow from one song to another. Or not Absolutely. Like you, you hit, you're hitting the nail right in the head. The parameters for the dosage though, are the following. Generally the tempo of the music should be in a medium range, nothing too fast and nothing too slow. Hmm. Because you're connecting, th this is the important thing. And there's a word for this uh, that's also used in different ways. And the word is entrainment. It's a word from physics where two bodies wind up being in sync together. Okay. So you want to play a medium tempo uh, generally, but you have a good range. And in fact, the range, we actually have numbers. 60 beats per minute to 100 beats per minute mm. and the music because that's the normal range of a heartbeat sure is 60 to 100 right. okay that's the first thing second thing you want to keep the music mostly in a major key a little bit minor but mostly in a major and what and that's kind of obvious it's you, you want to keep it uplifting but uh you you also want in each set a number of the pieces fit a category that I call bittersweet because there's a lot of depression in an ICU. Mm. There's a lot of anxiety and you never start out. Um, uh, you, ha you have to just be careful uh, on, on, on the flow of that. Now it took, I, because of the pandemic slowing things down, I actually had a whole year to live with this music hmm. and to make these sets. Um, and um, the idea is that every set is a journey from the first note to the last note. That person is in a 20 minute journey. Hmm. And I, I always like to say the only time a patient in an ICU can leave the ICU while they're a, still a patient is when the musician is there because they close their eyes and they go someplace. You know, a, a million times I've heard somebody say at the end of a set, I was walking in a beautiful meadow on a spring day. Hmm. That's a perfect example of what I mean by that. So um, I, I came up with the uh, music and um, and I recorded it here uh, in New York, and I'll give a little plug. Uh, I recorded it with Ted Spencer Studios uh, here on the Upper West Side near where I live. Ted Spencer is a fantastic uh, producer and engineer. When you're doing, uh, he has a home studio, but it's a completely professional studio, meaning I was in a small intimate place with a brilliant engineer. You so know, you were the great. musician, you did, you did all the yes. sets yourself. Yes. Okay. So you sat down and you recorded these and I guess there was some editing. And so what you ended up with was three essentially 20 minute pieces of audio that yeah. were played. They, through they the wound day. up being they wound up being about 17 minutes just okay. to, just for clarity. But uh yeah, 17 to 20 minutes. All right. And so then so then somebody then took this these recordings via iPod or some kind of playback device into an ICU room, into where, like where the bed was, where the patient was. So to measure their reaction, they like taped them up to sensors and stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, what happened was, first of all, the study got a really big grant from the National Endowment of the Arts. They were able to have a custom made speaker mm. built, designed, uh, Jag Conwall, the neuroscientist, is a really, really uh, very capable guy. And uh, they had this special speaker made, and I never got down to Washington while they did the study. 
but I heard from everybody that they, they said the sound was amazing. Mm. And, and the quality of sound, by the way, is crucial to, for I'm music sure it to be is, sure. It's really, really crucial. So that it was important to have a decent speaker that really... It was a great you. speaker in a okay. special cabinet on wheels. Mm. And then they would wheel it to the bedside. And they had a laptop computer for the music. And uh, they had, uh, uh, in terms of monitoring the patients medically, the first most important thing for the results is that they took, they measured the cortisol levels in each patient. That's a chemical in your body. And when your cortisol level is high, it means you're very stressed out. And uh, it's very, and very high cortisol levels are dangerous. Patients in an ICU generally have high cortisol levels. Mm -hmm. And so they would take a swab, you, you, you swab inside the mouth, they would swab before, during, and after each set. Mm -hmm. And the results were that... Um, for uh, again i don't know if this is all the patients i i've heard it was for many if not all of them at the end of the second day the cortisol levels were normal hmm. that's so they huge came down. yeah that's huge yeah that is in huge. terms of the speeding up the healing this is the other thing is that music medical music in an icu can shorten the the uh, stay time in the unit it can decrease the need for analgesics, you know, painkillers and so on and so forth. And it can even decrease. Uh, I just was on a Zoom two days ago with a young fellow at Boston, a doctor who's doing a study. Uh, and, and they have discovered that it, music uh, can decrease the time spent on a ventilator. This is all really big deal stuff. Yeah. So so, so so you mailed me uh, emailed me a a very detailed it's a sh a, sh a chart of uh, that that shows everything from the inception to a bunch of graphs and charts which made my head explode frankly but you then sent me a summary of the results which right. which is really which is helpful uh, and I'm just going to hit a couple of them here detailed analysis showed significant changes in multiple cardiac parameters including yeah. heart rate uh, variability similar to that in normal healthy subjects. So that implies that heart rates went from being abnormal to being becoming normal. Right. And that's cool. Uh, music yeah. presentation appears to be influenced by musicality or the tendency of a person's interest and exposure to music in the past. So somebody who is a musical person for lack of a better term right. has a, has a better outcome because of, because of the application of the music. Is that fair? Yeah. Well, I can tell you again, I was in ICUs for 10 years doing this. And the fact is most people like music. Yeah. That's a There's a rate. small percentage at the top uh, well, I don't know, not that small. I mean, let's say, let's say it's 15% of people who can't live without music, love music, including mm -hmm. musicians or non-musicians who just adore music. You've got about, let's say, 15% of that. And then at the bottom, you have about maybe 5 to 10% of people who just are not into music. Hmm. And it's hard for me to believe to not be into music like at all. Yeah, How's yeah. I, I, I think uh, I think there's a study I read once. There's a term called uh, an amusa. I think it's amusa. It's somebody who doesn't like music. Hmm. No, I, I think that number in the study that I read was about five percent. Okay. So it's a very small percentage of people. I know, but still, and, you know. 5% of the population doesn't like music? Yeah, doesn't like music. Yeah, don't, don't respond to music. But And there's that big in, in area in the middle. Sure. Um, and so, you know, when I, part of the method that I have of playing in an ICU is that after I, when I first arrive in an ICU, the first thing I do is um, after I've gotten the guitar all tuned up and everything and ready to go, I go to the main computer monitor so I look at the, the vital signs of every patient in the unit. Hmm. That gives me a starting point. Okay. And then the next thing you do, I'm a classical guitarist who plays Beatles and Gershwin and Bach 
and Mozart, but I, uh, uh, most classical guitarists don't use a guitar strap, but I do. Because I have a guitar strap, I can play quietly and walk through the whole unit. Mm -hmm. And the reason that you do that is we discovered early on that if I just set up a chair at the nurse's station and nurses ask patients, do you want to hear music? About 80% said no. If the, if the nurses said, do you want to hear music? Because they don't know who it is, you know, yeah. people, and they're in a delicate, sensitive place, and they go, no, I don't want that. But, but if, if you're I was, bringing the music to them. If you walk past them, and there's yeah. a particular piece that I always played, early 19th century a piece for the guitar, which is very lyrical and lovely, and you walk past and they hear that, then it went up to about 80% said they did want music. And there were times um, that there were patients that I would play for, sometimes for weeks, even in a few cases for a couple of months, that's how sick they were, hmm. where you would be in that, not 20 minutes, but an hour hmm. or more. And th that is based on, uh, and especially um, the very first bedside I would go to in a unit is if it's somebody in a coma, mm -hmm. because I know firsthand what music can do in a coma. Sure. And what you do is y when you sit there and play, you can't be involved in your instrument. You have, that's why I say you, it really makes a difference for it to be a skilled, a mostly professional musician. You can't be focused on the instrument. You have to be looking up at the computer monitor, mm. at the vital signs monitor, and you have to be w looking at the patient constantly. And you watch, especially you watch the face, the hands, and the feet. Because you, and what you're looking for always are signs of agitation. Mm. Because if there are signs of agitation, what you're doing is not helping. Also, if the computer monitor, if the vital signs show you, if the blood pressure is bad and it gets worse, you have to either change what you're doing or in there are cases it's not music is not appropriate for that person. And well, that's really interesting. So out. you're not just going in there and playing and, you know, you're actually paying attention to the details and the response of the patient by, as you just said, looking at their face, looking at their eyes, looking at their monitors. And I can see that that doesn't take just, you know, any kid off the street that requires training. I'm sure some patients, you know, and also you're not playing on a stage in front of, you know, 500 people. You're playing for a very specific reason here. I'm imagining that takes a little bit of discipline, too. An ICU is a room of life and death. Yeah. And you feel that responsibility completely. It's a very tough gig. It's a wonderful gig. It's, it's the best gig in the world for leaving your ego at the door. Yeah. Because 0% is about you. Right, but it must be a great feeling at the end to know that you made a difference in a patient's in a patient's Oh, it's recovery. unbelievably good. I'm sure it is. Yeah. It's an incredible feeling. But the medical musician knows, and sometimes you have to share this with the doctor and the nurse. If you play, got to that bedside, and you play, and there's absolutely no change in the blood, heart rate and blood pressure, that's not good. Mm. Because when you play music, music is an emotional experience for the player and for the listener. Okay. If the person is not responsive, meaning they're either heavily sedated, uh, and by the way, playing for people when they're sleeping is a great thing to do. I'll come back. To, let's not forget that. I want to come back to that in a minute. But if the person is not responsive and you start playing for them and nothing changes, mm -hmm. that's not good. Because they're not processing that nothing is going on. And it's usually a sign. And this was told to me, you know, everything I know, I know from the doctors and nurses. That was the training I had. This is not my uh, invention that, of you. what I'm saying. So that's not good. You want to see a little, bit, a little bit of movement. Now, nurses who don't know me, if somebody has never worked for me and their patient is sleeping and I say I want to play for them, uh, they immediately go, no, no, no. Yeah, you don't want to wake them up. Getting, right? You're getting sleep in an ICU. is so hard. We finally got them to sleep. But here's what, what I know from experience and from my own experience and from playing. People sleep in an ICU is usually not good sleep. 
and it's usually not good dreams because you're, the ICU is never quiet. There's beeping machines, there's voices, unfamiliar voices, and there's a constant level of sound noise. And that affects the dreams. And the reports of bad dreams is very, very, very common. Hmm. So I developed a technique for this. And once the nurses saw that, then, then they wanted me at the bedside when they're sleeping. You, you sit there at that bedside and um, can I pick up my guitar for this? Or? Yeah, of course. When I go to a bedside and the patient is sleeping, there's a technique that I use and I call sneaking in. As I said, there's beeps, right? So the very first thing I do with those beeps is I go like this. Ah. I imitate whatever beep is going on. You're piggybacking the sound that exists in the room already. I'm piggybacking the sound that's in the room. And let's say I'll start off, I'm just playing the note A on the first string. And after a little while, I move it up. And I'll spend one or two minutes doing this because it's, it's not going to wake them up because it's just another beep. And then I harmonize it. This is maybe two minutes in, I'm doing this. And you're watching them. They're not waking up. Hmm. And then... start playing a beautiful lyrical piece of music and um, you can do that and uh, I could be there 15 20 minutes and the nurses will come in and they'll watch and they know it because you see the person's face relax mm -hmm. you see the chest moving up higher they're breathing deeper they're going into deeper sleep and um, I have many times then later seen that patient and said, how was your sleep? How are your dreams? And they'll say, yeah, it was great. You know, it really made a difference. So uh, that, I was going to ask you, so do you get, do you often get patients who come to you and say, I heard you playing, the music made a difference. I felt better because of the music or are they oblivious yeah. a lot of the time? No, no, you hear that a lot. You hear yeah. that a lot. In fact, because I, I was aware during my coma of a lot of things that were going on around me, except in my coma dreams, it was not the reality of what that actually was. My mind made up different scenarios, but I heard, well, uh, I heard everything. Actually, mm -hmm. while you're in the coma, you hear everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, many times I have played for patients who were in a coma and where they were successfully brought out of the coma and I will go over and I'll be sitting there and playing for them and I say, do you remember hearing music? And I, I, uh, not always, but uh, I would say 80% of the time the person will go, yes, I do remember hearing music. Oh, that's cool. So um, the last thing I want to ask you is what what's – so I'm assuming you're still a VIP at Beth Israel Medical Center. Do you still go there and play there? I, I uh, No, I was at Beth Israel, and um, uh, then I changed uh, uh, to uh, New, uh, NYU Langone, uh, where I loved being there also, uh, great hospital. And then I wound up getting involved in a wonderful monthly residency at Berkshire Medical Center in uh, the Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts. So you're doing that now? No, no, I did that for four years. Okay. Then I started, I actually have, an, my affiliation now is at uh, Georgetown University Medical Center where I'm a visiting artist. Okay. And again, during that, there were the, the two, three years of the pandemic. So they, you know, there was no mute, live music. Some hospitals were still using music. They didn't have music. And I got involved with another project, which was writing a second book, which I'm still working on. I'm writing a novel. Oh, sweet. Uh, yeah, it's a historical novel set in the 18th century. And wow. music is at the heart of it. Wow, can't so wait I to got, see that. Thank you. So I got involved in doing that. And um, uh, something pr pretty exciting is going to be coming up this fall. There is a new documentary film 
in the process of being made. It's in Oh, this is Heartbeat, right? Heartbeat is yes. in pre-production. And you're part of that. I saw you listed there. Have they interviewed you yeah. for that or they will? Probably in the fall, maybe in October. So you've got a lot going on here. You've come a long way since 1973 when you were playing uh, – Ain't she sweet at the Quisasana welcome show on Saturday nights <laughs> with me on right. drums. And uh, you you were playing bass at the time, I think. Right. But I think you also did classical concerts on the, the classical nights right on Sunday. That nights. got me started. That's yeah. that, that Those were the first real concerts that I gave. One of the things that I'm proudest of is my involvement now since 2017 with the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Mm. Um, some of the leadership people there read Waking the Spirit. And I was invited to join as a professional member. I, I'm very proud to say I was the first musician that they accepted as a professional member. That's and awesome. I, I, I mean, sit that's groundbreaking, on, really, you know? Well, you know, the mission is to get this out all over the world. And I am a member of a, a, a committee, the ICU Liberation Committee, which is what it sounds like. It's how to make the ICU environment better for all the people who are there, the patients, the families, and the staff. My belief firmly is this, that if every ICU in the world had a dedicated therapeutic musician on staff as a member of the team, you would have better outcomes. Bart, we will look for you in the film. We're going to look for your first novel. I've Thank written you. novels too. It's a whole different thing. I look forward to it. Great to talk to you again. And thanks for joining me one more time. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be talking with you.